Welcome back to the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture Conference, Fall Conference. I, it is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Gary Anderson. He is the Hesburgh Professor of Catholic Thought in the Department of Theology here at Notre Dame, as well as a faculty fellow of the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture. His specialty is in the area of Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament. His latest book, which is out next week, but available for sale here right now at the conference, is That I May Dwell Among Them, Incarnation and Atonement in the Tabernacle Narrative. Friends, Gary Anderson. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Professor Hava Tirosh Samuelson. She received her PhD from the Hebrew University in 1978, and her initial area of interest was that of Jewish intellectual history, with a special interest in the period of the Renaissance, as well as the study of Jewish mysticism, or as it's sometimes called, Kabbalah. She's currently the Regents Professor of History and the Irving and Miriam Lowe Professor of Modern Judaism at Arizona State University. She served this university for some 25 years. As her scholarly career has progressed, so has the range and depth of her intellectual achievements. In her many publications, she's covered a wide variety of topics in the fields of intellectual history and the interface of religion and science. For her work in the latter area, she's been the recipient of a number of very large fellowships from the Templeton Foundation. Her most recent award is for a project entitled Beyond Secularization, A New Approach to the Study of Religion, Science, and Technology in Public Life. She is uniquely situated in terms of her competence and native intellectual interests to address the concerns of this conference. Tonight's lecture is entitled Personhood, Relationality and Responsibility, Jewish Philosophers on Contemporary Technology, taking her departure from four significant Jewish thinkers, all, at least in my view, from the relatively recent past, uh, Martin Buber, Hans Jonas, Emmanuel Levinas, and Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. Professor T. Roche Samuelson will engage the challenge posed by a transhumanist futurism that often looks askance at human embodied existence. Please join me in offering her a warm welcome to our university. Good evening and Shabbat Shalom. Let me first thank Professor Carl Sneed and his staff, Margaret Kabanis and Justin Petrisek, for the invitation to participate in this marvelous conference. When the invitation was issued, wherever it was, I don't remember the date, but wherever it was, I believe June probably, none of us could have imagined that in early November, this conference would take place in the midst of war. As a person who was born and raised in Israel, a Jewish intellectual who studies the Jewish historical experience, a scholar whose worldview is at least in part shaped by Jewish texts, beliefs, and rituals, I want to open my remarks on this Shabbat with the words from the Jewish liturgy. In every Jewish service, prayer service, these words are repeated several times, including in the Kaddish prayer, which is recited by people who were recently orphaned or who lost members of their immediate family. The words of the prayer express their grief, longing, and hope. These words, I believe, are most appropriate, appropriate in this evening for all the people who are experiencing the tragic losses of war. Let me say these words first in Hebrew. O se shalom bim romav, hu ya se shalom, aleinu val kol Israel, val kol yoshvei tevel, 
ve'imru amen. I'm translating. May the makers of peace above make peace for us, all Israel and all who dwell on earth, and let us say amen. For the past day, day and a half actually, we have listened to profound philosophical and theological reflections on the meaning of human personhood. We raised many questions. How is a person different from an individual or from a self? Are only human beings to be considered persons? If so, by virtue of what do human persons differ from other beings? What does personhood consist of and what does personhood entail? How is personhood related to rights and to duties? Is personhood shared by all humans or some humans are more persons than other humans? Who determines or who assigns personhood to individuals or to group? Should personhood be accorded to non-human animals or for example to plants? And what about human-made machines that mimic human behavior and are currently intimately involved in our daily life? So do machines have personhood? These and many other challenging, challenging questions have generated a vast interdisciplinary discourse on personhood in the fields of law, economics, politics, medicine, philosophy, theology, and ethics. The discourse on personhood, as we have seen in this conference, engages highly contested themes such as abortion, disability, race and ethnicity, sexuality and gender, end-of-life issues, biomedical technology, and many other themes or topics. So why are we so concerned with the meaning of personhood today? My answer is because our lives are increasingly governed by impersonal forces that threaten our individual, our individuality as well as our collective humaneness. Because as human beings who are created in the image of God, we behave in ways that fall short of what personhood entails and demands. And because our personhood is currently erased by the machine we have built that sound like us and that mimic our behavior and even our thinking. So in this talk, I will not attempt to offer a theory of personhood, but invite us to think about personhood from a Judaic perspective. Now, I have a real challenge here accommodating both my text and this, so uh, let me see if I can handle it. If I cannot handle it, I will stay with my text. So, um, in this talk, I will not attempt to offer a theory of personhood, but invite us to think about the personhood from a Judaic perspective. I will do so by considering four influential thinkers, Martin Buber, Hans Jonas, Immanuel Levinas, and Rabbi and Lord Jonathan Sachs. Now let's get to, okay. These are the people I'm going to consider. Martin Buber on the left, on your left, Hans Jonas, Emmanuel Levinas, Jonathan Sachs, and if you're not familiar with them, I highly recommend that you immerse yourself in their wonderful wisdom. Although their life experiences and views differ from each other, their insights respond to the most critical challenge of our time, the technologization of life. The ideological justification for this challenge is articulated by transhumanism, an intellectual movement that promises salvation by means of technology. Now, since I've written quite extensively, and I should also admit critically about transhumanism, I will not repeat my critique tonight. Rather, I wish to share with you my conviction that Judaism, and especially these four Jewish thinkers, offer us fruitful vantage points from which to assess the technologization of life and critique the transhumanist vision. In their distinctive ways, the four Jewish thinkers defended the preciousness of being human and cherished the mystery of human life, a mystery that ultimately resists philosophical analysis. Our four Jewish thinkers do not try and didn't try to explain away the mystery of human existence. 
They only shed light on it. Buber emphasized the relational nature of personhood. Jonas highlighted our embodied and embedded physicality and our responsibility for future generations. Levinas spoke about infinite responsibility of the irreducible other who imposes that responsibility on us. And Rabbi Sachs reflected on personhood and human freedom because personhood is grounded in divine creation, creation in the image of God. Taken together, these thinkers teach us that if we wish to live in peace with each other, with nature, and with the artifacts we make, we must pay attention to relationality, embodiment, responsibility, and freedom. Now the structure of my talk, obviously very simple, start with Buber, then go to Jonas, then Levinas, and conclude with Sachs, and a few more concluding comments or reflections. So let's start with Buber. I'm not gonna go through the various um, details of his life, but those who are familiar with it, may uh, it will e be a little bit easier for you if you know how to locate him. I will show you this book, famous book, Ihundu, uh, I and Thou, I and You, and we'll start with that. So in this very famous book, Buber begins, in the beginning is relation goes on in the, in the next page, there is no I taken in itself, but only the I of the primary word I thou and the I of the primary word I it. So in the beginning is relation, of course, echoes the book of Genesis as well as the gospel of John. Ontologically, epistemically, and ethically, relationality is primary. Relationality is constitutive in being human because it is through the encounter with the other that one develops as a whole person. Relational personhood is marked by dynamic interaction, mutuality, and reciprocity. We are who we are and we become who we are by virtue of these relations. But only one type of relation, the I-thou relation, helps us to become fully human persons and not only human individuals. These two primary words, okay, this is the point I just made, and we'll go here, so you can look at that while I'm talking. So, these primary words express different orientations to the world. I eat relation is monological, based on reducing the object to the quality that may be noticed thanks to ready-made categories. In I-it relations, we perceive, sense, feel, imagine, think, and experience something, but only by traveling, as Buber beautifully put it, over the surface of things, such as one wins an experience from them. The I-it stance is characterized by the subject-object duality that is marked by our separation from whatever we encounter through objectification and marked by control. We arrange, we order, we categorize the world of objects which we experience only through our own filters. The I-it relations is indeed one-sided, but it is also necessary and even inevitable. In the I-it world, we exist as individuals who are separate from others in, self, in a self-contained, isolated way, precisely because I-it relation is about control, predictability, objectification, possession, and use. It keeps us as individuals who perceive of everyone and everything as an object of personal consumption and gratification. The I-it stance prevents us from becoming full human persons, since personhood develops only in relations to the presence of the thou. Personhood emerges out of a dialogue with the other rather than objectification of use of the other, and dialogue cannot be thematized or objectified. It can only be experienced through mutuality and reciprocity. Personhood then is a living dialogue that we practice in our own embodied and embedded way. So 
let me move a little bit. This uh, the next step, uh, slide basically summarized what I just said to you, so I'll leave it here for a second. But in <coughs> if human personhood emerges through dialogue, who are the partners to either relations? It is well known that Buber extended the either relations to non-humans, to organic things such as plants and animals, to inorganic things such as rocks or a piece of clay, and to spiritual entities such as gods or God. One can have an either relation with natural entities. For example, in his case, he had a beautiful passage about a horse, a cat, and a tree. In, and this morning, I heard a beautiful paper about personal relationship, either relationship with a crane and a swan. Beautiful paper. Instead of looking at the natural en entities as objects for use or benefit, we treat natural entities as subjects that are allowed to be themselves and whose essence doesn't depend on a human point of view or interest or desire. When we regard nature as a moral subject that addresses the I as a thou, we do not take control of nature and we do not seek to manage nature. Instead, we embrace and we identify with nature but without ignoring its otherness. So for Buber then, personhood admits to various degrees based on the capacity for reciprocity. With living organism, reciprocity may be purely imaginary. More personhood is found in animals. As he said, the eyes of an animal have the capacity for a great language. And all those who have domestic pets probably would concur that pets are persons with distinct personalities. The absolute person is God, as Buber put it, him that whatever else he may be in addition enters direct relationship to us human beings through creative, revelatory, and redemptive acts, and thus makes us possible for, make it possible for us to enter into direct relationship with him. God, the absolute person in our, in, Sorry, God, the absolute person, is our interlocutor who always embraces us as thou. Unlike humans who oscillate between the I thou and the I reach relations, and unlike lower degree of personhood who are on the threshold of this relationship. But now, let's. Uh, so, if you need a kind of a summary of the dialogical situation, this particular slide helps to uh, capture that very point. But now we have to ask the next question, can we have an either relation with things? Buber's response is instructive, instructive, but to understand his approach, we need to place his work in the proper historical context. Now, Buber lived through the emergence of modern technology at the dawn of the 20th century. The rapid processes of industrialization, mechanization, and urbanization gave rise to a robust critique of modernity and the instrumental rationality that undergirded it, especially from European intellectuals under the sway of Nietzsche. I refer to Theodor Lessing, Ernst Stoller, Ludwig Klages, and Oswald Spengler. All of them critiqued the culture of disenchantment and the engineers that made it possible and brought it about. In the early decades of the 20th century, the cultural despisers of technology warned that machine-dominated culture not only made the Great War possible, but that the war spelled the self-dissolution of humanity when men become machine-like or slaves of murderous technologies. While the critics decried the rise of mechanical society, there were all other intellectuals who expressed deep faith in modern technology as a liberating force of humanity. Technology, they prophesied, would be the panacea of all social ills and would guarantee progress, equality, liberty, justice, and happiness. Now, unlike other intellectuals of his generations, and I'll just uh, show you that kind of uh, debate. This was the debate that I just referred to. Unlike the other intellectuals of his generation, as Asher Beeman has shown, Buber neither despised technology nor did he worship it. Instead, Buber offered a unique position that called for the humanization of things, the humanization of the it world, by considering its human makers and their broad cultural historical context. By considering you, the human makers of things, we de-objectify them. We recognize their inherent worth or dignity and the dignity of their makers. When we humanize things, we also endow human labor in which the things are necessarily involved with new meaning. 
Instead of exploitation and use, we turn physical labor into an activity that hallows or sanctifies the mundane world. Labor itself and the tools or instruments it employs become noble and even holy. In this manner, physical labor becomes a form of what Hasidism called worship through corporeality. Worship through corporeality was the key insight of Hasidism, this, a particular strand of modern Judaism that emerged in the 18th century as a response to the Jewish Enlightenment and as a critique of modernity in general. In Hasidic theology, the mundane world is enlivened by divine sparks with which human beings can interact and release them from their corporeal through, inten through intentional mindful labor. In Hebrew, that's called kavanah. And this is a Kabbalistic idea. I'll be glad to explore it with you if you're interested. When Buber sought to ennoble material artifact and manual labor with human-made tools, he suggested that we may even have an either relationship with artifact. So if you want a uh, kind of, let, let me go first to this, the idea, that idea, uh, that inspiration came from this person, Aharon David Gordon, the spiritual leader of labor Zionism, who joined the early communes in Palestine in 1904. He was a marvelous thinker, and people finally begin to catch up with the importance of his thought. There are a lot of new, new work that is done, but uh, uh, related to A.D. A. Gordon. The reason I uh, bring it up is that he enables us to think in a new way about the relationship two things. Now, take a look at this particular slide, and you'll see a reference to this book, The Piano Shop on the Left Bank. If you're not familiar with it, I highly recommend. It's a wonderful example to show how you can have a relationship with pianos in the way that Buber understood. In other words, you have to look at, their, at their, uh, those instruments as part of culture. There's a whole language that is connected to them. You can really care about who made the piano at what place and what time. There's a whole uh, world of culture, sociality, language, intentionality, interpretation, and more. So this is a beautiful example how Buber's, I Buber's ideas, as far as artifacts are concerned, can be um, illustrated. So now, what about this? What about our relationship with AI? I would say that here we're dealing with something different than, let's say, just a piano. And piano is a modern thing. It was created around 1700, I understand. Now, the human-made machine and devices we have built with human engineering ingenuity and skills are not mere tool. They are becoming closer and closer to being persons, quote, unquote, especially when we name them. Alexa, Siri, and what other name? Can we have an either relations with them? Do these devices expand our personhood or, in fact, restrict and even obliterate our personhood? Superficially, automated systems are like us because they use language, and thanks to Ray Kurzweil, they also seem to have a voice, or at least you can hear them and they respond to our requests, inquiries, and commands so successfully that we even call them personal assistants. So today, human-made machines control all aspects of our life, transportation, communication, economics, finance, politics, war, law, government, human relations, education, and even our bodies, our own bodies. As our world becomes more technologized, it becomes more impersonal and less humane. The most worrisome aspect of the process is that the humans who excel in the making and the use of these technologies have themselves lost their humaneness, becoming careless and mean exploiters of others, especially children, women, and the elderly. We may give personal names to AI systems and digital devices, thus deluding ourselves that we have personal relationship with them. We may even feel responsible toward the proper maintenance and functioning of the technological system or gadgets we have created. But there is no mutuality here. The digital gadgets do not have the same care and responsibility toward us, including toward their own makers. It is precisely this lack of caring that make it easy for criminals who gain expertise in automated technologies to exploit the technology for the purposes of preying on people who are not technologically adept, inflicting enormous harm, misery, and suffering. Why did we allow this to happen? 
Why have we created such a world in which our personhood has been disregarded, dismissed, and ultimately eviscerated? Contemporary technology has exacerbated I eat world and the expense, at the expense of the I thou world that, Bu that Buber envisioned. To people my age, this may not be so tragic since we have good number of years behind us of seeking and successfully finding of our relations. But what about our children, grandchildren, and their descendants? What is our responsibility toward these future generations? Do we owe them a different kind of world? Hans Jonas answered this question. Part two on Hans Jonas. Hans Jonas was remarkably prescient about the novelty and power of modern technology. In his The Imperative of Responsibility, or in German, Das Prinzip Verantwortung, Jonas articulated our human response to the trauma of World War II, in which new technology was unleashed on humans by other humans. By mid-20th mid century, the destructive power of human-made technology was in full display. In Auschwitz, technology industrialized death. And in Hiroshima, technology proved its ability, the ability of the human species to obliterate itself, along with the obliteration of other forms of life. Jonas responded to the threats of technology by highlighting the necessity of protecting human embodied existence and asserting our responsibility for future generations and for life on Earth. Jonas correctly claimed that modern technology is more than mere instruments to be used for human purposes. Modern technology forces human beings into a dialectical situation. Our attempt to bring the external world under our control and our power ends with the power of technology to destroy or radically refashion the very subject whose power it is. Jonas also correctly grasped the power and sorry, Sorry, while I'm saying this, you can take a look at some of his biographical facts. Jonas also correctly grasped the power of modern technology to set in motion a causal chain that has a profound effect on objects and peoples in very remote places, in future epochs, and understood that these changes are irreversible. If mistakes are made, correcting them is very difficult and in many cases impossible. Thus, modern technology, especially biotechnology and AI technology, changed the moral situation and undermined the entire pre-modern pre framework of human action. Jonas's task was to articulate a new ethics of our technological age that could take the new situation into consideration. So, what was so ins insightful about his ideas? What most insightful was the fact that he experienced as a soldier in the British Army fighting in Germany during World War II, he experienced the power of technology to destroy the possibility of future life. And he therefore became a champion of organic life. That's what this book summarizes for you, or this slide summarizes for you. So Jonas gave a phenomenological account of organic, including human life, and taught us to honor the natural world of which humans are integral part. He fused philosophical thinking of being with the science of evolutionary biology. Okay, I think I can go, well, no, let's say with that. He fused uh, the uh, philosophical thinking of being with the science of evolutionary biology. He grounded ethical obligation in the ontological claim that it is based on value of all living beings that exhibit for light itself. He offered new approach to the question of value in nature and he insisted that nature is inherently value oriented. He rejected the separation of value, uh, his separation between ought and is, a dogma that is no more than mere assumption and viewed the human, he viewed the human as part of the continuum of living being on a gradual scale that increases in complexity. Finally, he ascribed primordial subjectivity to all organism and he saw matter as a capacity for life and intelligence within itself. So Jonas really gave us a, a very complex phenomenology of life 
and his ethics really is grounded in ontology. The key aspect of his ontological ethics is the notion of obligation. The perception of an obligation contained in being itself has enough force to elicit a response in the human. The obligation is based on being and exists, the, sorry, is based on being that exists objectively. All human beings have the capacity to perceive it and respond to it. This capacity has evolved over time as humans develop the kind of mind that they have. In Jonas's ethics, consciousness and conscience arise and expand together. So in continuity with Buber, Jonas sought to reconfigure the subject-object split and overcome the rift between matter and spirit, between is and ought, as a crucial step toward responsibility for nature and for future generations. So, like Buber, and as we shall soon hear, like Levinas and Rabbi Sachs, Jonas was most attentive to the fact that humans' lived experience is mediated through the physical body. We are embodied persons, and our embodied capacity forge continuity between, I'll show you this beautiful, okay, here, this is what I want to share with you here. Um, we sh uh, and because of our embodied capacity, we have, a capac uh, we have the continuity between our past, our present, and future. Through our progeny, we experience the spontaneous practice of care, which is timeless archetype of responsibility, as he put it. Care is the fundamental condition of survival as well as the arena for self-realization. Care is inherently asymmetrical and unidirectional and is inherently future-oriented. From this insight, Jonas derived the argument about human responsibility toward the future of the planet. Human beings who have the, the knowledge and the power to impact the biosphere have the moral responsibility to ensure that the biosphere will not be threatened by human action. Jonas' phenomenology of life, his environmental philosophy, and his imperative of responsibility were all aspects of the same vision, how to live ethically in the age of technology. Now, Jonas didn't like to be known as a Jewish philosopher. He wished to articulate a philosophy that doesn't require justification by appealing to revelation. However, when he addressed Jewish audiences, Jonas felt freer to invoke Jewish sources and speak in a, clearly, in a more clearly religious Jewish idiom. So here is this wonderful passage from one of his talks in a synagogue in New Rochelle, actually. Judaism can help us restore a sense of reverence and awe toward nature and a sense of reverence and awe towards the ultimate essence of ourselves. So it can help us to restore a sense of reverence and humility toward tradition. It is only man who is isolated from the tradition through which the voice of God speaks, who is in the nihilistic situation, man who thinks he knows everything and needs to listen anymore to the long, and not listen anymore to the long dialogue in which man and God came to a mutual communication called the covenant. When it comes to wielding power on modern technology, I think Judaism can tell us one thing. Don't be too sure. Don't be too modern. So Jonas died just when the digital revolution kind of started to take off, three years after Ray Kurzweil published The Age of Intelligent Machines that uh, predicted and promoted the development of artificial intelligence and the whole movement of transhumanism, even though transhumanism started a little bit earlier. Jonas' precautionary principle uh, and his heuristic uh, of fear offered an implied critique of transhumanism. From Jonas' perspective, the human body must not be disdained, let alone hacked. There should not be a crusade on aging nor should we foolishly deny our mortality by fantasizing about cryonics. Humans should not be replaced by superintelligent machines, and the human makers of these machines should not be oblivious to the social impact of their in invention. Today, the question of how to live with intelligent machines concerns us all. Immanuel Levinas' analysis of otherness, or alterity, has been commonly invoked to discuss this issue but often the application of Levinas to the ethics of AI has gone, in my view, beyond what Levinas himself said. Part three, 
Levinas. Levinas is most influential today. For Levinas, ethics is a relation of infinite responsibility to the other person, but it's the other, not the self, who is the source of ethics. Levinas calls ontology to any relation to otherness that is reducible to comprehension or understanding. But the relation with the other goes beyond comprehension, and it doesn't affect us in terms of, theme, of a theme. Ethics is otherwise than knowledge. This is what Levinas had in mind when he claimed that ethics is first philosophy. That is, ethics is the attempt to describe a relation with the other person that cannot, that relationship cannot be reduced to comprehension. Relation to the other is about presence. It's the encounter, the face-to-face -face encounter, or face-to-face -face relation with the other, which is not a relation of perception or vision, but is always linguistic. The face is not something I see but something I speak to in speaking or calling or listening to the other. I'm not reflecting upon the other, but I'm actively and existentially engaged in a non subsumptive relation where I focus on the particular individual in front of me. In such an encounter, I'm not contemplating, I'm conversing. This is an event in which we encounter the presence of the other person. The encounter with the other is non-thematizable because the infinite other is irreducible and inexhaustible. The other resists being reduced to the same, and this resistance is what Levinas describes as the ethical. The other places an infinite responsibility on the relational self, and that's what he means by ethics as first philosophy. To those who are not familiar with Levinas, don't know what he looked like, here is a picture of him and a quick summary of his, uh, of his key dates in his life. This is some of his fam very famous books. It's really amazing what kind of industry we have today on uh, writing about Levinas. Uh, but Levinas really is uh, the key idea that I wanted to share with you, this notion of the irreducible, uh, the irreducible other. So Levinas defends personhood or subjectivity, but this is not intentional consciousness as it was for Husserl, for example. It is life as lived. Like Jonas, Levinas focuses on the materiality of life, on the love of life, the love of what life lives of what, sorry, love of what life lives from, namely the sensible, material world. Levinas and Jonas, we should remember, both of them were soldiers in World War II. Levinas was a soldier in the French uh, army and he fell as a prisoner of war. He spent four years as a prisoner of war in German labor camp and his experience in the, in the war was very important to developing his ideas. So like Jonas, Levinas' work offers us a material phenomenology of subjective life, where the conscious ego of representation is reduced to the sentient self of enjoyment. This self of enjoyment is capable of being claimed or called into question ethically by the other person. The other calls into question my spontaneity, my freedom. The ethical subject of Levinas is a sensible subject, not a conscious subject. If so, Levinas ethics is not an obligation toward the other mediated through the formal procedure or universalization of maxims or some appeal to good conscience. Rather, ethics is lived in the sensibility of an embodied exposure to the other. Precisely because the self is sensible, vulnerable, passive, open to pangs of hunger and errors, that is worthy of ethics. The deep structure of subjective experience is what Levinas calls psychism, namely it is structured in a relationship of responsibility or, respons or responsivity to the other. So the application of Levinas to the discourse on AI began about uh, 2000 and, uh, yeah, the year 2000, where Richard Cohen wrote, uh, who is a Levinas scholar, reflected uh, about cyber technology in light of Levinas's uh, philosophy. This conversation has continued, and today it's very interesting how, if you read the literature of ethics of AI, you'll find a lot of references to Levinas. So the question is why? Why is Levinas so attractive today to these kind of uh, reflections? It seems to me that it has to do with the critique, Levinas's critique of Western philosophy, which enabled thinkers to 
think otherwise, namely to find new ways that not only expand moral considerability, but also allow us to deal with very social and political issues, be there environmentalism or issues of technology. But thinking otherwise with Levinas raises the problem of responsibility. So a few words just very quickly about the, how complicated this is. Responsibility is a fuzzy sub-concept with numerous meanings, conditions, and application. We are responsible when we know what we're doing and we know what the consequences will be. Now let's think about AI. That's not the case in AI systems. AI system can cause a lot of harm, but they don't know what they're doing because they lack consciousness. So I share the view of Deborah, uh, of, uh, Deborah Johnson and Mark Huckelberg who say that machines can be agents, but they cannot be moral agents because they lack not only consciousness, but also free will, emotions, and the capacity to, to form intentions and the like. If machines and algorithms are irresponsible, where does responsibility lie? Is it with the innovator of the technology, the owner of the technology, maybe the user of the technology? Maybe the one who benefits from the technology, or maybe the one who regulates the technology, or perhaps all of the above. This is a genuine conundrum, and it makes the question of personhood, relationality, and responsibility even more complex and acute. Jewish ethicists such as Nadav Berman, Tal Zalski, Moise Navon, and David Tzvi Kalman, I'm sure you're not familiar with those names, but I'll mention them anyway, have begun to explore these issues by looking at Jewish law and apply to autonomous vehicles, autonomous weapon systems, and algorithm-based financial systems in the context of Jewish law and covenantal theology. But if you go back to non-Jewish thinkers, I'll just give you one example of David Gunkel. Uh, here, David Gunkel, who is an important ethicist, and he actually admires Levinas because he sees in Levinas a challenge to traditional assumption of moral philosophy when Levinas argued that ethics doesn't rely on metaphysical generalization, abstract formulas, or simple pieties. Instead, Levinas' philosophy is concerned with a response to and responsibility for the absolute other who is confronted in an irreducible face-to-face -face encounter. Although Gunkel admits that for Levinas, this other is always and unapologetically human, he also argues that Levinas allows us to think otherwise and expand the scope of the other by becoming more inclusive than he himself was. So uh, it seems to me that I like to interpret Levinas a little bit more conservatively than he does. The human is always, has to be, sorry, the other is always a human, and that's because for Levinas, as a product of the Musa tradition from Lithuania, embodiment is very, very important. So now, if that's the case, uh, I would like to uh, move, or maybe raise one more uh, question. Those who critique Levinas and say that he was too, you know, remained too anthropomorphic or too uh, humanistically oriented, they consider it a shortcoming. But I don't think that that's the case. It seems to me that that's exactly the greatness uh, of Levinas, the ability to speak about others as humans. So the humaneness of the other, which uh, Levinas considered as pointing to God, is precisely what AI systems erase when embodied humans become data. Digital technology, and especially AI technology, erase our personal identity, disregard our privacy, dismiss our inherent dignity because they deface us. When AI systems turn us into data, which can be harvested, manipulated, and sold to the highest bidder, just think about Cambridge Analytics or whatever the name was, right? They remove what Rabbi Sachs would insightfully call our dignity of difference, our particularity that cannot be severed from our physicality. This can be best evident in the teach in the technology of facial recognition that some AI ethicists have endorsed. However, David V. Kalman correctly challenged the application of Levinas' philosophy to face recognition technology when he stated, quote, Levinas would have banned facial recognition technology, and we should too. In the age of deep fake, our personhood is abolished, 
and with it our authenticity and our responsibility to the dignity of difference. While expanding the scope of moral considerability is an honorable goal, goal I do not think it justifies glossing over, ignoring, or dismissing Levinas's own humane teachings, which posit Levinas very much like Jonas and Rabbi Sachs as a critic of our technologically saturated society, rather than its endorsement, endorser. So now, Here's a summary of Levinas as the critic of AI, and I'm moving now to part four, my last part on Jonathan Sachs. So Buber, Jonas, and Levinas have been major inspiration to Rabbi Sachs, whom we lost pretty recently. The most influential, if you're not familiar with, me, with him, the most influential theologian, ethicist, and social theorist among Jews, at least, of our time. But whereas they were not, here, this is Jonathan Sachs, and that's the uh, key dates of his life or important activities. So um, Sachs, unlike them, is an Orthodox Jew. In The Dignity of Difference, How to Avoid Clash of Civilization, a book from 2003, he says the following, I'm not a liberal Jew. My faith is orthodox. I do not believe that the sanctity of human life and the inalienable freedoms of a just society are relative. They are religious absolutes. They flow directly from the proposition that it was not we who created God in our image, but God who made us in his image. These religious absolutes, Rabbi Sachs asserted, are the very tradition that Jews, Christians, and Muslims share. For that very reason, members of the three Abrahamic traditions can communicate with each other as we do here and now, while recognizing the distinctiveness and particularity of each tradition. Echoing Levinas, Rabbi Sachs challenging us to, quote, exercise Plato's ghost, ghost sorry, uh, namely, get rid of universalizing tendencies of Western philosophy while asserting, quote, that universality must be balanced with a new response for the local, the particular, and the unique, unquote. If we are to avoid, if we are to avoid the clash of civilization and prevent bloodshed and violence, we must be able to recognize and protect diversity, otherness, and multiplicity. As an Orthodox Jew, Sachs defended the right to be different, a right that belongs not to the liberal democratic state, but as he called it, to the compassionate society. Unbridled multiculturalism, he argued, was, has gone too far, bringing with it fragmentation, conflict, dysfunction, because we have lost the vision of the common good, which rests on religious absolutes. How can we restore the common good? By gaining the correct view on the relationship between the particular and the universal between human reason and divine revelation, between science and religion, between the secular and the sacred. Put differently, if we wish to protect the dignity of difference, but without corroding the common good, we need to have a proper understanding of the two main frameworks that provide meaning to people today, science and religion. In what he undertook to accomplish, this is exactly what he undertook to accomplish in his book, The Great Partnership. I think I have a, yeah, this is the, the famous book, The Great uh, Partnership. Many of the things that Sachs says actually repeat in various places in his writing. So you will, if you read Sachs, you will bump into the same kind of ideas in various formulations. So here's another, here's an example from the Great Partnership. In his clear and precise style, Sachs summarized the relations between science and religion. Science tells us what is. Religion tells us what ought to be. Science describes religion beacons, summons, calls. Science is object. Religion speaks to us as subject. Science practices detachment. Religion is the art of attachment, self to self, soul to soul. Science is the underlying order of the physical universe. Religion hears the music beneath the noise. Science is the conquest of ignorance. Religion is the redemption of solitude. We can easily hear the echoes of Buber, Jonas, and Levinas in this succinct paragraph. 
Science belongs to I eat world. Religion belongs to the I thou world. But humans occupy both worlds only through the great partnership of collaboration, cooperation, and mutual support between science and religion can we restore the common good according to Jonathan Sachs. So the key to all this, and I realize that my time is come getting, to the, uh, getting short, so the key to his insights is the doctrine of creation, uh, which both Abraham, all three Abrahamic traditions uh, share and accept of the, as their point of departure. As creator, God is radically transcendent to the world of nature that God has created. And in the act of creation lies freedom, the freedom of God from nature and the freedom of the human who is created in the image of God from material necessity. Rabbi Sachs has a both-end approach to science and religion, and that means that he emphasizes both transcendence and immanence, freedom and necessity, meaning and truth, eternality and, historic and historicity, re reality and emotion, uh, sorry, rationality and emotion and, and theory and practice, and of course that's all variation on one theme, the I eat and the I thou. So here's another famous quote from his uh, writing, but our task is in life is to choose. As he put it, quote, we are free. We are choosing animals. Life is choice. In that fact lies our dignity. If we deny freedom in theory, eventually we will lose it in practice, as happened in Nazi Germany and Stalinist Russia, and as may happen yet in you an unforeseeable way which is exactly the case. So I will uh, skip a little bit just to give you a sense of why freedom is so important to him because in freedom we find hope, the ability to hope, to imagine future, to aspire to live meaningful life. These are not possible without the assumption in his mind, the assumption of creation and especially creation uh, in the image of God. The alternative is the Nietzschean option of eternal recurrence. So the greatness of the Bible, the great discovery, as he put it, of Abrahamic monotheism, which transformed the human condition, endowing it with meaning and thereby rescuing it from the tragedy. But that rescue came from its the name of hope. For if God created the physical universe, then God is free. And if God made us in his image, we are free. If we are free, then history is not a matter of eternal recurrence because we can change ourselves, we can change the world. That is the religious basis of hope. So now let's try to look toward the conclusion, where does it all uh, lead us and how does it all relate to our current condition and in that current condition we live very much in technology. Uh, Sachs explicitly engaged the challenges of technology, especially AI technology, that we experience daily in many aspects of our life. He commented on the fast pace of technological change that uh, creates a cultural lag a state like now in which material culture, and I'm quoting from him, such as, such as technology is being transformed faster than non-material culture such as models of governance and social norms, unquote. Sachs insightfully viewed the Judaic worldview as a corrective response to the corrosive impact of AI technology on human life. His critique of technological society began, as I already noted, with the doctrine of uh, creation, and his emphasis is always on the concept of joy, the joy in participating in all forms of, uh, actually I would say all forms of Jewish life, daily, weekly, annually, in the observance of the commandments and in a personal relationship with God, which for Sachs is the primary source of joy. So AI technology, this is the irony of the situation and in my view also the tragedy of it. The AI technology was initially promoted by appealing to freedom. Presumably, AI would liberate us from all sorts of constraints. AI systems are supposed to enlarge the scope of human freedom by replacing workers from tedious labor, by shortening the decision-making processes through fast data analysis, or by translating bodily function into med medically relevant information that leads to better health outcomes. Mostly, AI technology promises greater freedom concerning one resource that humans need most, time. 
In its split-second calculations, AI technology can handle problems that earlier would have taken months, if not years or centuries. But does freedom lie merely in calculation? Can AI systems make decisions that negate or disrupt the way it was designed? I don't think so, and neither would Rabbi Sachs. For him, human freedom means freedom to err, to be accountable for choices, the freedom to repent and to ask for forgiveness, and the freedom to forgive. None of that can be ascribed to AI. So to conclude, we live in an age that shifted from the biological to the computational and the informational. Those who celebrate the shift present it as a fact that accounts for how the future must and will develop. The technologization of life is presented as a deterministic process in which no freedom is possible. Since in this narrative, at no point can we decide not to pursue certain technological path. Currently at least, AI system cannot be considered free since their algorithm cannot, can only function as they were programmed by their human designers. AI systems are artifacts devoid of freedom and I, for one, am deeply concerned about the increasing power that they exert over our life. While we, biological humans, increasingly lose our freedom, our personhood, our humaneness, and our dignity. All over the world, in authoritarian regimes and in weak and failing democracy, we witness how AI technology is used to curtail or eliminate freedom of thought, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, as surveillance methods become more sophisticated and more intrusive. AI technology threatens human freedom and the dignity of human life in many domains of contemporary life, but especially in economics and politics, where surveillance capitalism is closely linked to the rise of authoritarianism. So contrary to the dreams of technophiles, be they Ray Kurzweil, Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, Sam Altman, and the list can go on and on, AI has not delivered us happiness, but rather exacerbated Social problems including addictiveness, deceptiveness, shallowness, loneliness, lack of empathy, viciousness, exploitation, misogyny, racism, hate speech, and this list goes on and on and on. So, uh, of course, what, what we are, what, you, you get the gist of my, or kind of my critique, but I have to, to be honest and say that this is not to say we can revert to an earlier way I have, let me just find that, okay, here, here is kind of the world in which we live. This is the world of things in which we live, and this is the people. This is where, where we are today, we, and we see it all over us, right? You go to restaurants and people sitting with this, you know, talking to their, to their um, smartphone instead of to each other. So this is not to say that we can revert to earlier life, uh, way of life prior to the invention of AI but that we need to develop responsible AI and promote the design and engineering approaches that ensure the safe, beneficial, and fair use of AI technology. To do so, AI innovations should not be left to engineers and computer scientists, but involved humanists, ethicists, philosophers, anthropologists, scholars of religious studies, and, the, and people who do cultural studies, who could introduce human-centered approach to AI technology. Such an approach is indeed conservative, since it is urging us to use precedent, past wisdom, and conventional metaphysics as much as possible, and try to resolve ethical issues involving current and near future of AI technology. So the four Jewish thinkers I discussed offer us, in my view at least, profound insights that guide us in these perplexing time, urging us to remember our creaturely status and truth of being created in the image of God. Technology is not our salvation. Technology, for the most part, doesn't make us more humane, more caring, or more just. On the contrary, contemporary technology, especially AI technology, dehumanizes us by turning us into data and by turning our social life into Internet of Things. I, for one, consider the current veneration and obsession with technology as a form of techno-idolatry that undermine our freedom, our personhood, and our responsibility. I uh, wrote on that in uh, uh, theology. It's in another, it's in another uh, essay that I published not, not too long ago, two years ago. So, so um, absorbing the insights of Buber, Jonas, Levinas, and Sachs, and Dow are 
embodied physicality with meaning. It dignifies our mortality and temporality. And above all, it protects our personhood from the technologization and commodification of human life. If we acknowledge that from dust we are, and to dust shall we return, and that we are created in the image of God, we may be able to remain humble, honest, and good, creating societies that are free, caring, and just. Societies that can respect the mystery of being human and seek to live in peace. Thank you and Shabbat Shalom. Questions? You have time for questions? Would you be willing to receive some questions? Absolutely. Thank but I have much. to take this because I'm dying from heat. How about this? <laughs> Thank you. You're very welcome. We have time for a few questions. If you raise your hand, I'll be happy to uh, call on you. Uh, yes, right here. Oh, yes. Are there, there's a, there's there are a microphones. There's one back there. Ava, thank you for that really beautiful explication of these philosophers. So here's my question. Uh, we elders owe our descendants, that is many of the people in this room, a narrative that they can use to... Can we ask for some quiet, please? Oh. I would like to hear the question. Thank you. We, elders, owe our descendants, the people in this room, and I'm, I'm using that term intentionally, a narrative of futurity upon which they can build meaningful lives. And um, my sense uh, is that Levinas and Buber in particular, and I know Sachs less well, um, can offer this to uh, our descendants, if you will. And what we need are more of what the literary critic Eve Sedgwick called reparative narratives, and you've offered some of those to all of us tonight. Could you say a little bit more specifically about what, in particular, Buber and Levinas can offer? Narratives of what kind of life is livable for our descendants, meaning the people in the generations below us. Yes, yeah, so I think the word reparative that she used, and um, obviously Sedgwick was not a, uh, an observant Jew, but she knew enough about Judaism to have the mind, the, the, the concept of tikkun olam in her mind. So I think that repair, tikkun olam means mending the world, repairing the world. So that's probably what she had in mind. Now, how do we, how do we repair the, where, the world? That's open to debate. So she represents a particular kind of uh, gender approach to that question. Not everybody has to agree with that. But I think that both Buber and Levinas would give us a more activist approach toward the world. We have to make it better. We have to identify the problems. We can debate about the problems, but we can at least try to do something about it. So I don't think that there is a recipe here. There's no recipe. But there is, first of all, an attention to the other, to the problem of the other. There's attention to particularities. Stay away from generalities and universal principles. Let's look at this condition, at that person, at that situation, and so forth and so on. So I think that that would be the way to make the world a better, a little bit of a better place. But um, I guess that's the best I can, I can offer. She's also big on the role of narrative itself, how telling the story is going to be helpful. Uh, you know, we can argue about that. In the end, we do have to come up with policies. We have to deal with specific issues to which there are concrete solutions or not always solutions. So uh, it's 
I like the idea of tikkun olam. Obviously, it's uh, been thrown around in any kind of uh, social action today, but it's, it's useful. So I'm not sure I answered all, all your concern about her or what she brings to the story, but it seems to me that it's an application of the concept of tikkun olam. First, uh, two thank yous. Uh, thank you for the kind words on my uh, presentation this morning on the swans and cranes. And It was beautiful. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you for what a beautiful, beautiful presentation this evening. Thank you thank so you, much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. For those of us who are professors and those of us who are learners, we find ourselves sometimes, especially those of us at Catholic universities, and we're told to have diversity in our curriculum, and you've, you've so beautifully presented uh, from a tradition that's other than ours, but do you have one favorite uh, that a professor might think, oh, you should include this in your class, or a student should read of the four? Do you have a favorite? Oh, a person or a text? Well, how shall I? <laughs> well, I would say Boober. Boober is my favorite, but I have a big, let me, now I can handle this a little bit better. Let me show you this book. If you want to know about uh, Levinas, actually Carter knows because I gave him that, and uh, not Levinas, I meant to say Jonas. So this book, let me just get to the right uh, slide. Here, the one in the green, gives you everything you need to know. That's, a, that's an edited volume that came out of a conference that uh, I did in um, ASU in 205. And uh, it's edited together with my colleague, uh, Christian Wiese, who is in Frankfurt. And he's the author of the biography of Hans Jonas. That's the, the book in the red. So if you want to start with Jonas, Jonas is, is, is marvelous, but he's not easy. Is really not easy to get into. He writes in a very Germanic way. Uh, he never really mastered either Hebrew or English well enough to write well. So in that sense, it's not easy for students to get into Jonas. Buber is wonderful. And Buber wrote in beautiful ways. So if you ask my, my real personal f favorite is Buber. I think that Buber is very useful to many aspects of life. Uh, but it doesn't mean that all problems are solved by a Buberian uh, approach either. Uh, Jonathan Sachs, I knew very well personally. Uh, he's featured in the Library of Jewish Philosophers that I put together, of contemporary Jewish philosophers. He was a marvelous person. His loss is, is, is really, really, really sad because he's, he was, uh, well, how old? He's two years older than me, so I know exactly how old is he. Uh, so today he would have been 75. And... Uh, it's a terrible loss. So we actually, there's a lot of work now perpetuating, perpetuating and expanding the scope of, of uh, Sachs work. It's done in Israel, it's done in England. Uh, we had a big conference in uh, Israel and bar -Ilan on that. I was one of the speakers there. Uh, so Sachs is a marvelous writer. So the book, let's, let's get you, if you're gonna read one thing out of this lecture, uh, how about this one? Where is, where are you? Uh, here. That last book came out just a few months before he passed away. Uh, that's, that's the book to buy. Uh, and just to, to get the sense of his, uh, you know, his personality, his approach, is terrific. What else? No, because I have time. I don't know where we're going. Right? We're not going anywhere, right? <laughs> we can do yeah, yeah, they, they, you know, they, they, the punch will be there, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Yes, sir. Um, I'm Liam Waldron from Benedictine College, and thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is, you brought up that relationship of the I-it versus I-thou. How, as members of the younger generation, can we take that in mind and deepen our personal relationships with one another in a way that supersedes the intervention of AI. Beautiful. Number one, turn off your smartphone when you go with somebody to dinner or when you date somebody. But that's, that's a, yeah, <laughs> that's when we, uh, <laughs> so, 
no, I, I honestly, uh, I'll, I'll be, now you know how old I am, so I can speak from, from that vantage point. It really pains me to see what's going on among young people today. And it's true in the classroom, when people are so sucked into their, their computer, they can't listen and they can't even know. And you know what's interesting? Students don't know the names of people in their own classroom, even though they meet twice a, twice a week. I'm, I'm astounded by that. How is it possible? So they lose something in the personal communication with each other. How to start? Just to minimize the impact and the presence of technology. We don't have to become enslaved to it, but we have become enslaved. So you probably know about the, <laughs> about the notion of digital Shabbat. Have you heard about digital Shabbat? Start practicing on Shabbat. One day a week, you don't use it. So that's how you begin to kind of create limits. That's where the problems lie. We lost limits, we lost boundaries. Everything is done all the time. And that includes me too, because sometimes when I have to finish a paper or whatever, I'm at 12 o'clock at night, you know, working on my computer. There's something wrong here, and it affects our health, it affects our ability to interact with other people, it affects our ability to love, it affects our ability to care, the list can go on and on. So we just need to put some limits on it, but that's not the thrust of what we get from the Sam Altman and all the other people like him. It's really not. And, and these are the winners, we are the losers. So what we need to do is a little bit of a revolution here, <laughs> right? And young people can say, enough is enough. You know, just say that exactly as uh, Bill McKibben said the word enough, if you know, toward the environmental issues, we can say the same thing toward the technological issues. But we need to take control because right now it's controlling us. We don't control it. So. Thank you. Maybe I can just, I think we should bring it to a close. No, give it. When these people are done, let's finish here. Maybe can ask the questions at break, but I was asked by the convener to bring this to a close. To a close, okay, so I'm... I but maybe if I can say just one thing really quickly, I should have said this at the beginning, in, in Hebrew you say to a visitor who comes in, in Hebrew you say to a visitor who comes in, Baruch HaHaba'a, and meaning, you know, blessed is the one who has arrived in our presence, but I'll say it at the end, blessed is the one who's come into our presence. Baruch <laughs> HaMadim, all right, okay. Thank you.